Hello, everyone. Welcome to investment class. In this class, we're going to start from chapter two, asset classes and financial instruments. In this chapter, I'm going to introduce a broad range of assets and give you a brief introduction to the financial instruments. Instruments. Broadly speaking, we can divide financial markets into two markets. The first one is money market. In money markets, all the assets have maturity of less than one year. The second market is capital market. In capital markets, all the assets have maturity longer than one year. In money markets, we have treasury bills, certificates of deposit, commercial paper, bankers' acceptance, euro dollars, repos and rewards. Federal funds, brokers' calls. For the capital markets, we have all the indices, the bond markets, equity markets, derivative markets. The first and most important money market instrument is the Treasury bill, or T bill. The issuer of the Treasury bills is the federal government. Whenever the government need money. They can raise money by selling the treasury bills to the general public. When the general public, investors like you and me, purchase the treasury bills from the government, we are actually lending money to the government. The denomination of the treasury bills are one hundred dollars. Means you can buy the bills with incremental of one hundred dollars. Say one hundred, two hundred, five hundred. Or more commonly, ten thousand dollars. If you want to buy a hundred and three dollars, sorry, you can't because it has to be an incremental of at least one hundred dollars. The multiples of one hundred. The maturity of the treasury bill are four, thirteen, twenty-six, or fifty-two weeks. Or you can think about roughly one month, one quarter, half a year, one year. The liquidity of the treasury bills are very high. Actually, T bills are one、uh, are the most actively traded money market instrument. Default risk is none. Default risk means the issuer cannot pay the promised payment. So far, the U.S. government has never defaulted on the T bills, so it's considered as default risk free. Interest type is discount, means when you buy the bills, you never buy at the face value one hundred dollars. You always buy at a discount, say ninety eight dollars. So the face value sometimes we call it par value, or the stated maturity value, is the money you will get at the end of the maturity. Okay, all right. So in this example, when you purchase At ninety-eight dollars, while the face value is one hundred dollars, you have a guaranteed two dollars return. Well, you can't really pocket the whole two dollars because you have to pay tax on investment in returns. Well, let's briefly talk about taxation in the U.S. We have three layers of taxation: federal level, state level, and local level. For example. In each April, when you're preparing your income tax returns, you have to pay first federal level tax income tax. If you live in the New York State, you have to pay the New York State tax. If you live in New York City, in addition to the federal and the New York State tax, you have to pay the New York City the local tax as well. Okay, so three layers of taxes. On your income tax, on your income. Well, for the T bills, the two dollars return from the T bills have to pay federal tax only. You don't have to pay state or the local tax. When you purchase the T bills, you buy at a pure discount. It's called a pure discount because there is no coupon during the holding period. You can think of coupon as interest payment during 
the holding period. We have a whole chapter talking about bonds and coupons in the future chapters. So here, when you see the word coupon, you can just think of coupon as interest payment during your holding period. Well, for the T-bills, there are no coupon payments at all during your holding period. So your whole return, pure return, come from the discount from the face value. For example, if the return is 1%, or the market rate is 1%, while the price will be $1,000 divided by 1 plus 1% discount rate. So you pay $990 today, and then you can receive $1,000 at the end of the maturity. If on the second day, the market yield is higher, say to 1.25%, what is the new price of the T-bill? The price will fall to $1,000 divided by 1 plus 1 1.25%. So the new price will be $987. So instead of paying $990, the next day you can just pay $987 to purchase the same $1,000 same maturity treasury bills. So the next money market instrument is the certificate of deposit, which is a time deposit with the bank. For example, if you have $500 and you want to deposit in Bank of New Jersey, well, the maturity of the CD is fixed. For example, three months. Once you decide to deposit $500 in Bank of New Jersey for three months, you cannot withdraw the money on demand before the maturity. The banks will pay your interest and the principal only at the end of the fixed term of the CDs. The principal here really means the 500 original amount of deposit. So the maturity of the CDs, um, they vary, but typically at least 14 days. The issuer of the CDs are depository institutions, most commonly banks. The denomination is any, so you can put any money you want. If you have $105, that is okay, the bank will take it. The liquidity of the CDs are very high, especially for the CDs of three months or less. They are very, very liquid. So how about the default risk of the CDs? Well, most banks have to join have to purchase the insurance from the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, up to $150,000 issued. Means if you put $250,000 in the bank, say Bank of New Jersey, if the bank goes bankrupt, the insurance company will pay you up to $250,000. It means if you have $1 million and want to put it in the CDs, it's better to put the money in four different banks. Then you are fully covered. The interest type is compound interest, means the interest will generate interest as well. Taxation. All the interest payment you get from the bank will be fully taxable at federal level, state level, and local level. The commercial papers. The commercial papers are issued by large credit worthy corporations or financial institutions. They are used mainly to cover the short term liabilities. So let's take a look at the picture first. Savers, bank, and the corporation are the old ways of making loans. For example, the saver, you, have $1 million, and you deposit the $1 million in the bank. And then the bank takes your $1 million and lend it immediately to a corporation, say Google. In these old way loans, the bank will charge different interest to, will give different interest rate to you and Google, say 2% to the savers. When you deposit $1 million in the bank, the bank pays you 2%. Well, 
When the bank lend your one million dollars to Google, they will charge Google five percent interest rate. So the difference of the five percent and two percent, three percent is the profit for the bank to keep. So Google is not very happy with this arrangement. Then Google can issue commercial paper directly to you, the saver. So now you gave one million dollars directly to Google. Google pays you four percent. In this way, both you and Google are very happy because instead of getting two percent from the bank, you're getting four percent. Google is also happy because instead of paying five percent to the bank, Google is paying four percent to you. So everybody is happy. The denomination of the commercial paper is minimum of one hundred thousand dollars. The maturity. Maximum two hundred seventy days, most of the time one to two months, because the commercial papers are issued to cover short-term liabilities. So why two hundred seventy? Why that is a magic number? Because within two hundred two hundred seventy days, the companies do not need to register with the SEC, the Securities and the Exchange Commission. Which is very cost-effective means of financing. It saves you a lot of paperwork. The liquidity of the commercial papers is very high, especially the commercial papers of three months or less is very liquid. Default risk. Well, the issuers of the commercial paper are corporations and financial institutions. There is. No one hundred percent guarantee because they may go bankrupt and they may not pay you all the promised payments. But the default risk is relatively low. The commercial papers are mostly highly quality. Why? Two reasons. First, the issuers are large credit worthy companies. Means. The probability for those big company to go bankrupt is relatively low. Especially, second reason, the maturity is within two hundred seventy days, which is very short term. A very large credit worthy company to go bankrupt within two hundred seventy days, that is very rare. The interest type is discount, means. When you buy the commercial papers, you never purchase at the face value. You always buy at a discount from the face value, and that discount is your dollar return. Taxation, whatever the return you get from the in investment in commercial papers, will have to pay tax at federal level, at state level, at local level. So you have to pay income tax. At a full range, the euro dollars are the dollars denominated deposit at foreign banks or foreign branches of American banks. So here, I want you to pay attention. The tag euro has nothing to do with euros or Europe or European. It really means foreign. You can think about all the dollars that is located. Outside U.S., so any U.S. dollars located outside the U.S. are called euro dollars. For example, dollar-dominated deposit in Japan, in China, are also called euro dollars. Why they want to locate outside the U.S. because they can escape the regulation by the Federal Reserve Board. Most of the time, they will pay higher interest rate than the U.S. deposit, but they have less liquidity and higher risk than the domestic dollar-dominated CDs. Federal funds and federal fund rate are the most important money market instruments. Let's first watch a short video and see what a federal funds and federal funds rate. To understand what the Fed funds rate is, let's first take a quick look at the banking system. So when people go to the bank and deposit money, we know that the bank takes that money and loans it out to other customers. 
Well, the U.S. government requires that the bank holds a percentage of the funds that are deposited. They call this the reserve requirement. As of now, the reserve requirement is about 10%. This reserve requirement is intended to force the bank to hold enough capital to serve everyday banking needs. Well, each day, deposits and loans happen, and sometimes more money flows out of a bank, and each night, all banks must be sure that they have enough to cover the reserve requirements. Well, these funds that a bank is required to hold aren't generally held in their vault. In fact, they usually hold their reserve requirements at the Federal Reserve. They call these federal funds. So if a bank does not have enough to cover their reserve requirements of 10%, well, they can borrow from another bank that have excess federal funds on hand. The interest rate that banks loan to each other each night to meet their reserve requirements is called the Fed Funds Rate. The Fed Funds Rate is important because it sets the tone for many other interest rates in the economy. Now that we know what is the federal fund rate, I will introduce the discount rate. Another way the bank can borrow funds to keep up the required reserve is by taking a loan directly from the Federal Reserve at a discount window. The discount rate is the interest rate the borrowing bank pays the Fed. The discount rate is normally higher than the federal funds rate because the Fed encouraged the banks to borrow among themselves at the federal funds rate, which is slightly lower. They want the bank using the Fed as the last resort to borrow money, so they keep the discount rate slightly higher than the federal funds rate as an incentive. The New York Fed website shows the daily update of the federal funds rate. Currently, the target rate is from 0 to 0.25%. LIBOR, London Interbank Offer Rate, is the rate at which large banks in London are willing to lend money among themselves. So LIBOR is very similar to federal fund rates, while well, federal fund rates is the rate the large banks in the U.S. are willing to lend money among themselves. This is the premier short-term interest rate quoted in the European market. It is used as a reference rate for a wide range of transactions. For example, when a company issues a corporate bond, they can set the corporate rate as LIBOR plus or minus 2%. In this exercise, we are looking at money market instruments. Which one of them is not a money market instrument? The answer is D, a treasury bond, because a treasury bond has a maturity longer than one year. Commercial paper is a short-term security issued by C, large, well-known companies to raise funds. That is the definition of the commercial paper. Money market securities are sometimes referred to as cash equivalent because A. They are safe and marketable. B. It's not right because money market securities are very liquid. They have very low risk, so C is not right. D. They are low denomination, which is also wrong. Because remember the commercial paper, the minimum purchase is $100,000. The most actively traded money market security is A, the treasury bills. Now we move on to the bond market. We're going to talk about the treasury notes and the bonds, corporate bonds and the municipal bonds. We're going to talk each one of them in the following slides. I want to introduce treasury notes and the treasury bonds first. Both of them are issued by the U.S. government, just like the T-bills by the federal government. The difference of the treasury bills, treasury notes, and the treasury bonds are the maturities. Recall the treasury bills have maturities of less than one year, while the treasury notes have maturity from 1 to 10 years. The bonds 
have maturities in 10 to 30 years. That's the only difference among the three. The triary nodes and the triary bonds are traded in denomination of $1,000. They are the price of the triary nodes and the triary bonds are quoted as percentage of par. For example, the price of the triary bond is 98%. It means if you buy $1,000 of the bond, you pay $980. They are considered as risk this. Here, the risk this means default risk free, because so far the US government have never default on the treasury notes or the treasury bonds or the T-bills. They are very critical benchmark rates for the long-term financial assets the taxes okay once you get any dollar returns from the treasury notes and the treasury bonds the returns will be taxed at federal level but they don't have to pay any state and local taxes just like the treasury bills corporate bonds are issued by private companies to borrow money from the general public because they are issued by private companies, so they have a higher, larger default risk than the government securities. We we'll have more detailed discussion in Chapter 10. 10. Municipal bonds are issued by the state and the local governments. The interest or the returns from the municipal bonds are exempt from federal, state, and local taxes in the issuing state. For example, if you purchase a municipal bond from New York City, then all the returns from this bond will not pay any federal, New York State, and New York City taxes at all. The maturity of the municipal bonds range from 1 to 30 years. There are two types of municipal bonds. The first one is called general obligation bond, which means all the payments are backed by the taxing power of the issuer. The second type is called revenue bonds, means all the payments are backed by the project's revenue. For example, the New York City municipal bond you just purchased is for to establish a new hospital, for example. If that bond is issued in the type of general obligation, it means doesn't really matter whether the new hospital will generate enough profits to pay you at all. As long as the New York City has enough taxing dollars, they will use the tax dollars to pay you. Revenue bonds is different. If that same hospi hospital municipal bond is issued in the revenue bond tab, which means if the hospital cannot generate enough revenue to pay the promised payments, you won't get any. So that is why most of the time, the general obligation bond will pay you a lower interest or lower return. Revenue bonds will give you a higher return because the risk is higher. So they gave you a higher return to compensate for the higher risk you have to take. Municipal bond pays you interest that is tax exempt, completely tax free, while the corporate bond offers you a return which is completely taxable. So when you are choosing between the municipal bond and a corporate bond, you have to calculate the after tax return and see which one is higher. So if T, lowercase t, is the investor's marginal tax rate, R is the before tax return on the taxable bond, for example, a corporate bond. RM is the municipal bond rate. Which one to pick, corporate bond or municipal bond? Well, we have to calculate the after tax return. The after tax return for the taxable bond is R times one minus T. If that number is higher than RM, then we should choose a taxable bond. Otherwise, municipal bond is better. This table shows you the equivalent taxable yields 
corresponding to the tax exempt yield. Let's, let me show you how to read the table. Let's take a look at the 5% first. Okay? If the tax exempt yield or the municipal bond yield is 4%, well, your personal income tax marginal tax level is 20%, which means 4% municipal bond and 5% taxable bond will make you equally happy. You will be indifferent between the two because if you get the 5% taxable return after you're paying the tax 20%, which means 5% times 1 minus 20%, which is exactly 4%. So 4% municipal bond yield is equivalent to a 5% taxable corporate bond. Take this for example, 5%, okay? When your tax rate is 40%, okay? Marginal tax rate is 40%, which means when you get the taxable corporate bond return, 5%, you can only keep a after-tax return of 5% times 1 minus 40%, which is 3% which means a 3% tax-exempt municipal bond will make you equally happy with the 5% taxable corporate bonds. Okay, So you will be indifferent between the 3% municipal bond and the 5% corporate bond. In order for you to be indifferent between the after-tax return on a corporate bond paying 8.5% and a municipal bond paying 6.12%, what is your tax rate or the marginal tax rate? Okay, so the after-tax return or the tax-exempt return from the municipal bond is just 6.12%. Taxable return 8.5% times 1 minus the tax rate, then we can back out the T, the marginal tax rate, which is 28%. When your tax rate is 28%, you will be indifferent between the two bonds. An investor purchased one municipal bond and one corporate bond that pays the rate of 8% and 10% respectively. If the marginal tax rate is 20%, what is the after-tax return of the two investments? Well, for the corporate bond, although the nominal return is 10%, but after you pay 20% tax, you get 8% after tax. For the municipal bond, you don't have to pay any tax at all, so the after-tax return is also 8%. Now we move on to the equity markets. First, we talk about the common stocks. When we buy stocks, most of the time we are buying common stocks. When you purchase one share of common stock, you're getting one share of the ownership in the company. For example, if you purchase one share of Apple, you have one share ownership of Apple company. You will get share of profits after taxes and debt service means after Apple company pays off all the taxes, employee wages, expenses, and coupon payments, interest payment, principal payments to the bondholders, whatever left in the profits will be shared by the common stockholders. The return of common stocks have no guarantees. If you purchase the stock today for $100, Tomorrow, it could go up to $110 or go down to $90. Nobody knows. If the company cannot pay for its debts, shareholders will have to give the company to the creditors. Means if the company's total assets itself cannot pay off all the coupons and principal payments to the creditors, the shareholders or the owners of the company will have to give whatever left in the company to the creditors and the shareholders will get nothing. Limited liability means the maximum loss in the common stock investment is your initial investment. 
For example, if you purchase the stock for one hundred dollars, the liability is limited to the one hundred dollars your initial investment. Because the worst case scenario for a common stock is the price goes down to zero. When you purchase the common stocks, you will have the voting rights on all matters of corporate governance. Now we move on to the preferred stocks. It stands between common stocks and bonds. It likes the bonds because it promises a fixed payment of income each year, which is called a dividend. Well, at the same time, those dividends can be skipped or withheld by the company if the company is not really doing well. So in that sense, it's very risky, like the common stocks. Well, preferred stocks most of the time have a dividend that must be paid out before any dividends can be paid to common stockholders. Therefore, the shares of the common stocks. Have no voting rights, so the advantage of the preferred stocks is you have priority in terms of receiving the dividends, but at the cost of having no voting rights. So the advantage of the preferred stocks is, in terms of getting earnings, dividends, or in the event of liquidation, you are ranked. Before the common stockholders to get your residual claim, the disadvantage is you do not have the voting rights, and also the potential for appreciation is lower than common stocks. The advantages of the common stocks: the stockholders of the common stocks is allowed to participate in earnings. That is, if the company is doing well. The benefits are passed on to the shareholder in the form of dividends, and/or increase the market price of the stock. When you invest in fixed income securities, for example, bonds or preferred stocks, the investors receive a fixed amount, regardless of the earnings of the firm. Common stock investment also represents ownership in the company, giving the owner. Shareholders' voting rights. That is another advantage. The shareholder is liable only for the amount of shareholders' investment in the stock, which is limited liability. The maximum loss a shareholder can incur is your initial investment in the stock. Stock. The disadvantage of common stocks. The cash flow from dividends. And appreciation of the stock are uncertain. The firm makes no commitment to the common stockholders regarding the future income resulting from common stock ownership. The claims of the bondholders and other creditors always come before the benefits of the common stockholders. The preferred shareholders must receive dividends prior to common stockholders. If preferred dividends are skipped. These dividends accumulative, and skipped dividends must be paid before common dividends are paid. Therefore, the claims of the common shareholders are residual. That is, only after all other creditors and investors' claims have been met will the claims of the common stock owners be honored. In the event of the firm's bankruptcy, a Most shareholders can lose its original investment in the firm's stock, which is true. It happens all the time. B. Common stockholders are the first in line to receive their claims on the firm's asset. That is wrong because they are the last in line. They have the residual claim. C. Bondholders have claim to what is left from the liquidation of the firm's asset after paying the shareholders. That is wrong again. It should be the shareholders have the claim to what is left from the liquidation of the firm after paying the bondholders, because bondholders have higher priority to receive the assets from the firm. D. The claims of preferred shareholders are honored before 
the common stockholders. That is right, because the common stockholders always comes last. So the correct answer is E. Both A and D are correct. Now we move on to stock market indices. Here we are going to introduce some very important US market stock indices. The first one I want to introduce is called Dow Jones Industrial Average. The index is composed of 30 largest publicly traded companies, for example, Disney. The second one is S&P 500. It is a more broad-based index. It consists of 500 largest stocks in the US market. Then the Russell 1000 is 1000 largest securities based on the market cap. And this index represents around 92% of the total US market. So when we talk about the size of the company, we're really talking about market cap. Market cap is calculated as the stock price times the total shares outstanding, means the total shares available for trade. So the multiple of the price and outstanding shares is the size or the market cap of the company. We also have some international indices. The most famous ones are the MSCI World, MSCI IFA, and MSCI Emerging Markets. MSCI stands for Morgan Stanley Capital International. We have the following slides showing you all the international indices offered by the MSCI. Here is a list of MSCI stock indices. For example, if you are interested in one particular country, you can purchase the country index, for example, China. India, Korea. Well, if you are not sure which country to invest, you can invest in an index focusing in an area, for example, emerging markets. Then you can purchase the MSCI emerging markets. That index will invest in all the countries included in the emerging markets. If you are interested in the frontier markets, the green ones in this table, then you can purchase the MSCI Frontier Markets Index. That index will invest in all the countries in the green box. When we construct stock indexes, we have to think about one important question, which is, how is the index weighted? Means, what is the weight you put to each stock? We have three ways to do that. The first one is price weighted. A good example is the Dow. When the Dow calculating the weight for each stock, the only factor it's considering is the price. The second one is the market or value weighted index. Good examples are S&P 500 and MSCI Capital International. When the indexes are constructed, the weight of each stock is calculated using the market cap or the multiples of price and shares outstanding. So here we are going to consider two factors, price and shares. Finally, we have the equal weight. For example, the value line index. Equal weighting is very simple. If the index consists of, say, 10 stocks, then each stock will account for 10% of the index. So now we are going to look at a numeric example to construct the price weighted average index. Now suppose we have a price index consists of only two stocks, ABC and XYZ. Let's first look at the initial setup. The initial price for both stocks, $25 and $100. Final price, you can think of the close price as of today, $30 and $90. Shares outstanding, 20 and 1 million shares. So the initial value of the outstanding stocks are 500 and 100 million dollars. So for ABC, which is 25 dollars times 20 shares outstanding, so 500. 
million dollars. For X, Y, Z, that is one hundred dollars price times one share, one million shares outstanding. So the total initial value of outstanding stock for X, Y, Z is one hundred million dollars. So the total is six million dollars. The final value of the outstanding stocks will be the final price times shares outstanding. For ABC, $30 times 20 million shares outstanding at $600 million. For XYZ, that will be $90 times 1 million shares, so $90 million in total. So the total value of the index will be $690. Okay. Now let's construct the price weighted average because when we look at the price weighted index, we only look at the price, this one particular factor. When we construct index, ABC is trading at $25. So we put $25 in ABC and $100 in XYZ to construct our initial value, which is $125. While well, the final value will be the change of the price, 30 plus 90, $120. So the percentage change in our index is a minus 4%, or 4% lost. To calculate the percentage change in the index, we use the final value minus initial value divided by the initial value, which is minus 4%. Why our index incur a 4% loss? Because using the price as the factor to weight the index, we put a lot higher weight on XYZ, which is a losing stock, and a smaller weight on ABC, which is a winning stock. So overall, the index, the price weighted index, incurred a 4% loss. So now let's use the same two stocks to construct a market evaluated index. So now instead of just looking at the stock price, we are looking at the total value of the stocks, which is 600 and 690. As you can see, the value of ABC is $500 million. The value of XYZ is only $100 million. So the weight you put in the ABC stock is a lot higher than the XYZ. Okay? Then the percentage change in the index is actually 15% capital gain because you put a lot higher weight in the winning stock, ABC, and a very small weight in the losing stock, XYZ. Now finally, let's calculate equally weighted index using the same two stocks. Because we only have two stocks, if we want to equally weight the index, then we put 50% in ABC and 50% money in XYZ. Now suppose we put $100 each initially, which means $100 can buy four shares of ABC while only one share of XYZ. Okay, so initially we have $200 invested in the index. The final index value will be the new price times the shares you purchased, which is $30 times four shares plus the new price, $90 times one share. The final index value is 210. Percentage change is 5%.